Alrighty, good afternoon everyone. I wanted to welcome you all to the first of a three-part series that we are doing with the JCC and they are all around public sculpture. So this is the first part of our talk. This is the sculpture in the Arboretum section, which is the outdoor park at the Reading Museum. And then in June, we have a program coming about uh, the murals of Berks County. And those will be all over the county, not just in our local Reading area. And then in July, we're doing birds and bears and frogs, oh my. And this is to highlight the animal figural sculpture that we have in Berks County. So a couple things to please consider while we are talking about public sculpture is first of all, in this talk, most public sculpture will be considered abstract. And this is purposeful by both the museum and the artists themselves because abstract works of art invite the viewer in. They're not so much about telling the complete story, but allowing the viewer to kind of Rorschach test their way in and around the sculptures. Now, for a lot of people, they love abstract works. They like minimal works. And for other people, it drives them off a wall because it reminds them of Ikea. So we're gonna see a bit of both today. And then uh, some works are meant to blend in. So these are the ones that are kind of peeking behind trees, a little bit more natural. And then there are ones whose sole purpose is to stand out and say, engage with me. And then lastly, unfortunately, there are only so many materials that are useful in making outdoor sculpture. And so we're gonna see a lot of metal here. So um, hope you're ready for our tour of the Reading Public Museum Arboretum Sculpture. There we go. So this is just an overview for those who are not familiar with this space. Uh, Lara and I and some friends and family met up and so we were able to experience these artworks as a group. So you will see uh, various people in them because as I came to learn, when you are photographing public sculpture, prepare to say, you're gonna be in the frame, you're gonna be in the shot a whole lot because I think Lara said that about 50 times. Mm -hmm. So the first work that we are going to start with is right next to the museum. So we're kind of doing a start at the museum and come around tight. So if you'd like to follow along on your maps, we are just in front of the museum here. So this is column series five. And this is steel where the plates have been soldered together and shined up. Now this particular piece has been painted white so that it stays neutral. This is commenting on a type of two-dimensional artwork called a prone, which is by El Lizitsky. And he really wanted to discuss and discover how it would look for three-dimensional objects to be portrayed as moving through space, but in a two-dimensional medium. And he was very passionate about this style and he took it into his architecture. And so you can see how El Lizitsky here is playing with the bars going through space, what's actually a sphere in the top, but because it has descended so far down, it looks like a circle. And that is exactly what column five is playing with. It is bringing a painting to life. And it is meant for you to circumambulate, to walk around, to see it from all the different views and angles so that you can appreciate simple forms moving through space. One of the things I love about these works of art is that they were initially meant by their artists to be universally understood because they're working with shapes, geometric shapes that are familiar to most people, the cylinder, the pyramidal, um, yes, of course, pyramidal <laughs> shapes that I can't recommend, that I can't remember right now. Um, and so that's what this is playing with. Now, my only wish is that for all of these sculptures that there was more of a path to walk around them because in order to enjoy all the different views of these sculptures you kind of have to walk into the grass so make sure that you have some nice shoes when you see this in person 
So moving next to the museum, we were there, we're going to the other side, is Untitled. Now, Untitled is probably, for me, as an art historian, one of the most frustrating titles in the world because it gives us nothing to work with. And so we really have to know about this artist. And this artist is working in bronze, and what he is doing is creating a geophony. It is a soundscape using weather and natural elements. And if you look at the work of art here, you can see that there are purposeful holes put in, and these are to encourage wind to go through and create a whistling sound. There are very tiny ones here. And then these kind of um, fingerprint dangly things, those are to catch the rain. And these are also to catch the rain. And so if you look on the back, you see that he added um, almost like pan flute whistles here. And so this type of piece really comes alive during the windiest days. And so that's one of my favorite things about public sculpture is they are meant to be enjoyed in all kinds of weather because the experience of it will change. So why does the piece look so bumpy and just unclean? Because it was used, it was made using the lost wax casting technique. And this is the second of the techniques we'll talk about. The first was the tack welding along the side, you polish it up like we saw in our last piece. But with lost wax casting, the artist actually creates a clay mold, a, a clay model of what they want to do. And clay is amazingly supple, so you can get a lot of fine detail. And then after you pack it in a plaster, you turn it upside down, fill it with wax. And then once you have the clay with a wax exterior, you put your draining holes in it, and then you pack it in a heavier plaster so that you can then pour metal in it. And then as it cures, uh, fires, depending on the metal that you're using, you wait for it to set. And then you have this beautiful metal piece. And then you just take off all your little plug holes, polish it up. And what most people don't fully think about as part of the process, artists put the patina on. And so this work <clears throat> looks very green and very heavily patinaed. And the artist made that. So when it was new, the piece automatically looked like it was heavily weathered. And again, this adds to the story of how nature and weather and seasons play into the artwork. I also like that it's obviously been moved at some point because the you can see the outline of the previous base. So I wonder how did it sound better or worse? Yes. Is his name is Harry Bertoya? Yes. Uh, Henry, yes, I may have had an error there. You have to look on your map, but I, <coughs> sorry. <laughs> also, uh, you did bring up a good point. This piece took 10 years to make. So a lot of these can be done in a single year. Some take a little bit more. Is it possible that the reason it got moved was when we had that flood a number of years ago, perhaps it was dislodged? Absolutely. Um, I'm just wondering. No, no, we'll, we'll talk about the repositioning of the, the works due to f flood. That is, uh, that's a big part of the, the narrative for one of the pieces coming up. This one, I'm honestly not sure um, because that seems to be very old um, fixative on the bottom. And so unfortunately, Reading doesn't let all of their uh, fine tunings known, but something happened. Speaking of something happening, this is one of their current exhibitions for families. And so this is a remote control censored triceratops. It's exactly as jarring as you would think it would be as you're rounding the corner coming from your car and all of a sudden you hear this brrrr and yeah. But the kids loved it, and the head moves up and down, and it's a really fun way for the museum to kind of keep this space open. I was, like you, a little bit worried as I see the base there. Uh, but no, when we were there, a lot of kids were enjoying it. 
And it was something that they could identify, so that was fun. From across from the entrance, directly across in the median, is Bronze Root by Steve Tobin. Now, imagine this piece as a lost wax piece of art completely. I do not know whether or not this is a cast piece of an actual root. Knowing the artist, I wouldn't doubt it. Or if it is handmade from his imagination, this is a fantastic job because up close you can see all the gnarls and all the pits and it's really fantastic. Uh, the hardest part about this piece is resisting climbing all over it because it's absolutely beautiful. And I like how it adds this nice contrast to the wedding um, pavilion that's behind it. Also, I did want to highlight the fact that in certain angles, it plays very well with the surrounding trees. And so it looks kind of like this Ent from Tolkien kind of coming out and welcoming people to the dual purpose of the museum, which I am going to take a half moment to talk about that. So the Reading Public Museum is actually one of the few remaining art and natural science museums left in the United States. When museums were first created, they were considered for everyone, all types of education, including moral education, history, art, science, and as museums became more and more specialized into art and science, many institutions were not able to keep up their financial backing to have both stories being told simultaneously. And Reading is one of the few that is left because of our community support that really, in, that really welcomes this nature and art together. So these works of art can generally be grouped into a few major categories, memorials, is number one. There's a lot of memorial sculpture in this, but this is an example of this kind of natural heritage, which makes sense because this is an arboretum. So this is one of the pieces where the flooding absolutely changed its story. So this is the Itzam Na Stella, and the artist is Bovenkamp. Now, this is an abstract work of art. Can anyone give me any idea, any stab in the dark, what they think this one's about? A woman. What? A woman. A woman, okay. Anybody else? I know. That's about how I felt when I saw it at first. But Itzamna is the Aztec deity that bridges heaven and earth sky and land, good and bad. And it's this duality that the artwork is playing with. He's also known as a river god. And so that's why his original spot, as was pointed out, was down here next to the river. Unfortunately, and I have to uh, kind of get out of this screen for a moment and this site and not all the way to the right. All the way to the right. Thank you so much. Yeah. So here are um, some images of, unfortunately, the artwork during the 2019 flood was carried off its base. And one half was found about six miles uh, down river. And another piece was found more locally. to do that and so um, this is an unfortunate example of how these sculptures look amazingly heavy and amazingly weighty but they're not this piece in particular is uh, steel plates with um, bars in the middle and it's mostly hollow and so that's how it looks so massive but it was able to literally float down the river so because of that, uh, they were also able to find a few of the memorial benches that had also swept down river. And in order to keep it safe, they moved it up to the top here. And so 
This piece is actually one of the most famous in the museum. It was featured in Town and Country magazine in 2008. And so this work just keeps becoming more and more relevant. However, I think that it's unfortunate the lack of explanation that a lot of these sculptures have because if someone would have just made a little plaque that said this is the duality and bringing together you know heaven and earth and i would have felt more in the moment but unfortunately for this one it seems you needed a little bit more knowledge to come in so this one is one of my favorites and this is untitled. Again, this is a double whammy. It's untitled and no date. So for an art historian, this gives me kind of agita trying, but according to the artist, this is supposed to be an interstellar visitor to our area. And so this is a biomorphic work of abstract art that's suggesting a life form, maybe some sort of blown up amoeba, or maybe a blown up tardigrade, or something cosmic that is just encountering Reading Public Museum and the sculpture around it. Again, they tried to put it on a bit of a bend, but really this guy, he changes every time you look at him, and I love to sit at the stoplight and kind of say hello to my little friend because he looks like he's waving at you. I have a question. Sure. Is there a specific kind of theme used here so that it withstands all the weather and doesn't need to be repainted? Or? So the type of paint that would be used here um, would be powder coating, and that's the same thing that you have on your cars or your motorcycle or something like that. It is less of a paint and more of a fixative to the actual metal. So yes, this is uh, pretty much made in the same way as a car. So, But this is one of the most colorful works. I do not think there are very many that match this. The only one would be on the other end, and we're talking other end as in down there other end, is a piece called RA055. And unfortunately that was too much of a walk for me that day, so I couldn't see it. But um, that's the only other welcoming sculpture in primary colors. And that one's fun because it's made out of household materials. And so you see like a pot and an electrical outlet and stuff like that. And he's just super cute. Oh, that's where the other one went. Good to know. <laughs> so, such sweet thunder. Now, there we go. So this is a work one of the more recent ones, and again, its title really doesn't resonate with me, nor its shape, but again, once you know a little bit more. So we are going to hope that this works, and oh, I hear it a little bit. So this is the song Such Sweet Thunder by Duke Ellington, if you could strain to hear it a little bit. Um, and the song is a visual, sorry, the artwork is a visual representation of the syncopated um, drums along with the smooth jazz and the four movements. And if you listen to the piece, you can kind of feel the syncopation of the rivets and you can kind of feel the jazz in this work of art. Well, again, this work was made specifically to celebrate Duke Ellington and the Burke's Jazz Fest. Makes sense, right? It's right on the corner. It's inviting us and letting people know about the jazz tradition in Reading, but without any sort of label to help you out, it kind of falls flat a little in my personal opinion. But that's also because I was not familiar with the song. So this is one of the more difficult pieces. And it's only difficult because aesthetically it is so abrasive that people want to just kind of slide past this. So can anyone tell me who is Juno in the story of the Judgment of Paris? 
choose between the two female gods. The Who three. Is the most beautiful? Yep. He was given. He was given the task that Zeus that Zeus didn't want to say who was the most pretty. Zeus's wife, Zeus's daughter, or the goddess of love and beauty. And Zeus said, absolutely not. There's this guy, Paris. He, he's a great judge of beauty. And Paris did not pick Juno, who is the wife of Zeus. And so Juno very famously turned very jealous and very rageful and she tried to sabotage the younger women so that they would lose. And then from this, we get the story of the Trojan War. So this piece is supposed to represent the envy and the jealousy and the rage and all those really terrible feelings that we have as people that can bubble up to the surface. And that is mimicked in this kind of craggy uh, type of representation. Now, this is Efflorescence 2, and there are a few Barrett pieces on the grounds, but they, two of them follow the same theme. The other one was a much earlier piece and kind of follows um, more structural like the uh, columns. But this is his more contemporary pieces in 98 and uh, 2006. So what Barrett is doing here is he's playing with the idea of lost wax casting he takes a slab of wax and a stylus and he creates gestures. And then from there, he pulls the pieces out, looks at them all and then puts them back together. And so that's what you're seeing there, his actual gestural movements through space. And so again, as you kind of walk around it and you see these uh, appendages and you can make beautiful images as you can see as they play with the trees and they play with the sky and this kind of very light artwork that is abstract. So we've crossed over the bridge and we're now making our way down the high side. This is Centurion Marker by William Daly. Uh, Daly actually just passed away in uh, January. So this is a very fitting tribute for him. He is more well known as a clay uh, sculptor. He makes pots. And you can see how this very tactile um, clay work of his informed this stacked marker. So a centurion marker is a memorial marker. Uh, centurion markers have been used since the name suggests in uh, Greco-Roman times, except this is yelling out the names of the women and men who have passed of breast cancer. And those are the people who are listed on that plaque. Uh, to the left of the work. And so it is literally a piece that is about marking and screaming and celebrating their names and their lives. So this is one of the newest pieces. Uh, this is Dance Trees. And you can see that this is around the corner. Now this is a brand new installation. This has not replaced one of the previous sculptures. Now. Can someone see my immediate anxiety about the longevity of this piece? Yeah, where is it gonna start crumbling? Yes, the base. I do not know why anyone agreed to a log as a uh, foundation, but that is, in my humble opinion, something that should be re-looked at because it, it will not hold, but good for him. So Dancatrice is a reference to uh, Matteo's home island of Sicily. And it is to represent the abundance and the care and the love of the women in his life and how no matter how lean things are, the women in his life always love with the most emotion, with the most gravitas, and will do anything to make those in their lives happy. Now, I love this piece because very often women in sculpture, especially um, nude women in sculpture, 
are usually that Greco-Roman goddess, very covered, uh, very sensual. And this is sensual without being sexual. And I just love this playful, freeing expression and the sense of movement that it fosters. Now they were nice and put uh, some bushes around so you can circumambulate this one a little bit, but nowhere near as much as you uh, should be encouraged to because her face is also delightful. Now, believe it or not, this is actually in conversation with the two previous works. So here we have our dance trees. Remember that our Centurion Memorial was down here and then up in this little appendage. Now, for those of you who have been to the Arboretum recently, on a scale of one to 10 of wetness and ease of walking through this patch, especially right here, uh, yeah, it's on the lower side, unfortunately, because there are uh, natural springs that do open up here in order to feed the river. So unfortunately, the museum has kind of lost prime real estate in here. So they have created a kind of offshoot appendage for some of the works higher ground. Unfortunately, it is a little bit hilly to get there, so please be careful. And also there is no connecting um, walkway here, so you do kind of have to see the works and then come back around. I imagine that that will be changed later on as more and more sculptures become a part. So again, this is duet. It was originally conceived in 1987, but this bronze was made in 2020, making this one of the newest works of art. So as you can see, uh, this is an anatomical representation of female body parts. And again, this is reinforcing this idea of women should be loved and celebrated for number one, all of their parts, not just certain ones, but also this is representing life and rebirth and the womb, which is such a apt theme for the Arboretum because as things bloom and they die throughout the year as you see them all year long. So again, we have these three very feminine um, benchmarks really on the far side of the museum. And I think that that is a very interesting and welcomed stance to celebrate women, especially given how close it is to the hospital. And I'll be interested to know if Reading Hospital does anything specifically with women's reproductive cancers or something to make that even more of a, um, a welcoming decision. So as we continue on that little path, we have Phoenix. Of course, a phoenix is known for its ability to do what? Yes, rise from the ashes. And so as you come up the path, you kind of see this bird, but as you go by it, you see how the ashes are fluttering up into the sky. And again, with duet that we saw, this is very much a conversation of rebirth and healing and moving past whatever was bringing you down. Like, the pelicans. Pelicans are also up here. Now, I have a question. Does anyone know what the pelican stands for in Christian iconography and symbolism? Anybody has a guess? Bringing babies? What? <laughs> yeah, that would be the story. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> a small baby? <laughs> Actually, it has to do with babies. So in Christian iconography and Christian symbolism, um, the pelican usually represents the Eucharist or the sacrifice and blood of Christ because pelicans are thought to start attacking their own uh, chest in order to give their blood to their babies if there's no other food. So the mother will sacrifice themselves in nature so that her babies will survive. And so that's why the symbol of um, rebirth and parental sacrifice is, is very uh, common in certain types of Christian sculpture. On the flip side, on the other side, is not as religiously symbolic, but more 
uh, architecturally symbolic, we have the herons. Now, both these pieces were done at the same time, um, within a year of each other in 1930s, and we're looking at the Art Deco period. And the heron was a very specific and purposeful animal to put in your architectural sculpture. And so here's the 1928 um, Deco plaque from the Wacker Tower in Chicago to show what, what I mean. And so through this single architectural plaque, you can see elements of both types of birds. Of course, we have the heron, and then around the heron's feet are these um, reeds that you can see uh, are behind with the parrot, but the actual heron and the flowers and the, and the parrots all have this curvature to it and this sweetness and this naturalism to it that the pelicans are picking up. So the heron and the pelican are both very important birds in their Art Deco period, which is why I think a chronological tour of the sculptures would be fascinating to kind of see how the tastes change throughout the years. It would be a lot of backpedaling and it wouldn't be the most comfortable walking tour ever, but I think it would be fantastic to see how these ideals stayed the same or changed as the museum progressed. And then finally, on this leg, there's Suncatcher. Um, I have an antagonistic relationship with this piece because it's made of marble. And unless someone just hasn't been polishing it for a while, Suncatcher for me is a very odd term because it doesn't so much catch the sun, it just kind of frames it. Um, but again, that's semantics on my part. But as you can see, it makes a marvelous photo op for you to have a nice face framing. Um, now the sun catcher does have a conversation with another piece, the sundial. And the sundial is very close to the planetarium. And so this is another example of this kind of sciencey, naturalistic, um, more mathematical type of, of art. This piece I always have to say hello to. It just makes me light up because I know it's a sun, but it reminds me of a sunflower, but it also reminds me of kind of that Raggedy Ann and Andy type sparse uh, hairstyle. And it just reminds me of a little kid kind of peeking up to see what time it is. And as you can see, it is a working sundial when it's not cloudy and uh, you can tell the time. And it is just one of my favorite sweet pieces. And right next door is Lady Slipper. So this is by George Papa Shibley, and he also created the mother bear and cub piece that unfortunately uh, was uh, covered. They were doing some lawn maintenance around uh, this area up here where uh, Troy and um, mother bear and cub because I don't know if any of you heard that but one of the tree limbs fell on top of Troy uh, a couple months ago and damaged the piece so they're in the process of doing um, some tree cutting so uh, lady slipper now this is in the vein of a nature marker it's porphyry stone which is fantastic porphyry has its history in uh, the tombs of the Egyptian pharaohs and some of the earliest Greco-Roman emperors and the stone itself interacts with nature by changing colors as it gets wet. So you can see some of the oxidation that's been happening around the outside, but then the petals will actually turn this deep, um, almost like an algae green. And it's such a beautiful piece to see when it's raining and the one side so if you follow our path and you're walking back towards the parking lot you will see the lady slipper however if you pass it and turn back around you will see the hummingbird so it's what i assume to be a path marker however um this piece has a couple more mysteries like the lady slipper is a carnivorous plant. So why are you celebrating a carnivorous plant? Should I be worried? 
going into the auditorium? I mean, is something going like, is this a warning plaque that I'm missing? And on the other side is this representation of a hummingbird, but hummingbirds are rarely seen with their wings flat out. And so this piece is something that you can just dive into and kind of pick apart in your own mind and it's great fun and uh, I, en I enjoy all of this. So we are going to end with the male figural representations around the museum because two of these examples are great and one is mm, a little problematic. So Boy with Gulls ironically has been moved to the spot where Itzumna Stella floated away. I do not know what it may be. Uh, Boy with Gulls is, is heavier or sturdier, but I didn't notice it when we were there. So it's either tucked behind the uh, wedding pavilion or that space is, is just very uh, suspect right now and they're doing land uh, water studies for it. So Boy with Gulls, we didn't see when we were there. Um, but it, it could be. Uh, speaking of which, they do move these sculptures. They rent them, they rent them, they loan them out, and they just come with a big crane, boop, and just move them. Some of them uh, come off in pieces, but if you're ever around there and you see a giant crane in the museum area, that's what they're doing, just moving things around. So, good representation of male figural sculpture, boy with gulls. When you see that, you see, aha, there's this boy, he's playing with gulls. And then right next to a uh, bronze root is a loan piece from uh, the Seward Johnson initiative, and that is Monet, our visiting artist. So this is a mixed media piece. It, there's some metal, there's some fabric, there's some paint, and it's approximately life-size of a 27-year-old Monet painting the Reading Public Museum. It's very cute um, and it's appropriate because it welcomes you in and lets you know that, first of all, you have the art museum and then the second piece you see is bronze root. So it also highlights the science aspect. Great. Now, we have Hayden. Hayden is this figure here and he is in bronze. And he exists in the very last spot when we were talking about our life and rebirth and getting through. So that's where Phoenix is and Pelican and Duet. And at the very top here is Hayden. Can anyone see what could be a slight problem with putting this sculpture right next to the road where there's a whole bunch of lights going by? What could it do to someone? blind them or spook them to think that there's somebody looking at them. All over the country, figural sculpture is being removed from wooded settings. Because if you're jogging or playing with your kids, or if you're just, you know, driving by and you just catch a glimpse of a dark shadowy figure in the museum <laughs> area, uh, it, it can give people a little bit of an unsettling feeling. So I have a hunch that especially since the other sculptures have a very clear theme of femininity and rebirth and renewal and healing, I think that Hayden is going to be put somewhere else because this is actually considered to be not safe by uh, current museum standards. So it's just one of those things that every time I see them, I just think, well, glad you're still there, friend. We'll see you in a few years. So I wanted to thank you all for coming on this curated tour. Now there are 29 pieces at the museum and there was no way that I could talk about all of them. And so I tried to give you a kind of highlight and a flavor of what is there. Um, and when you see pieces like the Bill Barrett, you'll know 100% what's going on because it's the same theme. So. I would love to take any questions. Yes. How are the artists selected? How are they selected? A lot of these pieces, I would say a third, 
are memorial pieces. So they're either a donation from a family in loving memory. Um, Boy with Gulls is one of those pieces. Um, or it is a gift from the artist. Surprisingly enough, Bronze Root and Such Sweet Thunder are on loan from the artist, which explains why sometimes you see um, the Bronze Root and sometimes you'll see Giant Ant for a while. They're both the same artist, but they kind of get switched in and out depending on the season. Um, and then others, very few, I would say less than three, are actually bought by friends of the museum. And so I do not know if that is significant because that means that the Arboretum and the sculpture within are considered an autonomous group separate from the museum um, and their permanent collection. But yeah, a lot of it's gifts, which is magnificent that we have such a generous community. And I hope you enjoyed the Reading Public Museum and hope to see you next time for Murals of Berks County.